All right, welcome to the third episode of People Don't Like Us, featuring my guest, Brian Kerwin, CEO of, what was that again? Kerwin Development Strategies. All right, and what do you guys do at Kerwin Development Strategies? Well, primarily, uh, we consult political campaigns and have uh, done that off and on, but, but uh, the company was formed in 2012. Uh, we do some business consulting too, uh, from websites to social media to public engagement, public relations, but our bread and butter are political campaigns and communication. Okay. And is it strictly Republican campaigns? Republican or nonpartisan. Uh, in this game, you got to pick a side. Right. You really can't go, I'm a Democrat this week, I'm a Republican six months from now. Right. But then right. both sides think that, you know, you're up for grabs and you're a security leak, I guess. Um, but there are a lot of local elections like mayor and city council that are nonpartisan and, you know, you work for anybody then, but in, in state and federal races, you've got to pick a party and I've only worked Republican. Got you. So obviously the reason I have you here is to talk about kind of what it is to be a Republican. So I just wanted to start by jumping into your kind of bullet point life story about how you got into politics, what drew you to being a Republican over a Democrat or anything else? I mean, I guess there is nothing else since you just said you got to pick a side, right? So um, just what what brought you to your views in politics and uh, yeah, just start to to present in, in a rough, <laughs> rough uh, short story. Well, we'll start really, really early. Um, my mom was from a family of union Democrats. My dad was from party activists in the Republican Party. So the result of that was they never spoke about politics at home. <laughs> I, there was never a political conversation in my house. Uh, my first real involved, my first political thought was I remember in grade school in 1980, and everybody did all these little posters for Reagan versus Jimmy Carter. And I knew I was with Ronald Reagan. I knew I didn't like Jimmy Carter. I had no idea why. I was probably about 11 or 12 years old. You so don't think your dad had any kind of influence on that? Not, and I don't remember my dad or my mom ever even talking about politics at all. Hmm. Um, so, but, you know, I got into the high, I got into high school and, and kind of got interested in just, you know, watching the news. Like, was editor of the school newspaper. So I kind of, you know, I got to, you know, say whatever I wanted in the newspaper about the issues. Nice. It was a monthly newspaper, but I always thought I was gonna be a reporter. I always thought I was gonna be a newspaper person um, until I got to college and I started on the radio station. And I was like, man, forget being a reporter. I'm gonna be, a, I'm gonna be a DJ. Oh, and, nice. 19, uh, in 1989, I was, I was interning at Z104 here in Hampton Roads, and a guy named Ellis B. Feaster said, I'm going to lend you a video cassette. There's a guy you've got to, you've got to, you've got to watch. He did a TV show. You've got to see this. His name's Rush Limbaugh, and he'd be right up your alley. So I watched this videotape of this guy named Rush Limbaugh, never heard of Is him. this just based off of some political view you shared or something? Not really. We were just, all I wanted to do was play music and, you know, and go out to remotes and hand out t-shirts. Okay. Um, so the, it was your journey into he was just radio, saying, radio was radio, if you're real, Yeah, he was like, he, he was basically, it wasn't, you got to see this guy because you're a Republican. It's you got to right. see this guy because... This guy's doing radio like nobody else is doing radio. Gotcha. And so, so I watched it. It was just nuts. Rush Limbaugh in the 80s was like the most controversial. People were protesting, trying to get him thrown off the air every week. And they would, they, they would try to, to mess up his broadcast and just shout and scream from the audience. Man, this is amazing. Was um, it just, was it like vulgarity or was it? Uh... No, it was just because... It, it was in the middle of the AIDS epidemic, so of course he was a homophobe, and and he he was opposed to abortion, and the abortion activists were all up on his case because he didn't want giving women the right to choose. So he was against. He was a racist, sexist, homophobe, 
Right. Uh, and, he just, and, and he's just sitting there, never raising his voice, always smiling and just, you know, just saying what he wants to say, always keeping his cool. And these people were going nuts. And, I, and it was like, and it's almost like, you know, it was almost like a pro wrestler. It's like, he just got that crowd wrapped around his finger emotionally. How the heck did somebody just through communication get people so riled up? All he's right. doing is talking and these people are, are screaming at him. So that, you weren't too concerned about the context of what he was saying, just the reaction that he was getting. No, it was like Rowdy Roddy Piper. All he has to do is look at the crowd and, and they, want, they, they want to throw him out of the building. Right. I'm starting to think, you know, how can a person do that? How can a person take a, a, a crowd of people and just get them all either riled up positively or negatively? But what, right. what is it about that person? What is it about this, this political thing that gets people so emotionally involved? Okay. And uh, I see what you're saying now. So it makes me question politics in general. Right. It's because, you know, nobody gets all riled up about, well, my favorite song was number two in the top 10 countdown and it should have been number one. So at this point, your school time was just like super surf, superficial, just like you just liked Reagan and that yeah. was kind of it. There was no like delve into politics or no. too much on the issues. Other I than never, and, what and, you did for papers, which would have been like adolescent thoughts on <laughs> whatever yeah, silly issues. Yeah, I wrote an editor. I wrote an editorial that my high school should have amateur wrestling. You know? um, okay. <laughs> so, so, um, but when I was in college, all I wanted to do was work at a radio station, play music, and uh, and and that was that was pretty much it. I never really thought, and I never until 1997 never even thought of getting involved in politics 1997 was a strange year for me interesting I, 1997 i'll never forget it i came home from work i turned on the tv and they said there's a town hall meeting at the library tonight hosted by channel 13 and the virginian pilot come on out and make your views known. and i had absolutely nothing going on so I just got in my car, went to the library, signed up to speak, gave a three-minute speech, and came home. I was gone for about an hour. Um, was that the first home. time you were on TV? Well, I didn't know it was going to be TV. Okay. Um, it was, I thought it was just a meeting. Um, right. So what happened was they called me a few days later, found out that it was like a casting call. The town hall meeting, they wanted to get a panel together for the governor's election that year okay and they basically held the town halls at different cities around hampton roads trying to find a cross-section of people to be on their tv panel and i was picked so now i'm going down to the tv studio every week and i'm they're they're they're, they're clipping things that i that people say and they show it on the news right so this is how I learned about sound bites. I learned that if you say something and it takes you 20 seconds to say it, you don't get on the news. Right. Somebody on the panel who was able to say something in five or six seconds, they got on the news. So I learned really, really quickly, okay, the key to communication when it comes to the news media is be brief. You know, right. Five, six, seven seconds the most. That's how you get yourself on TV. Um, newspaper, you could probably talk a little longer. I got my picture on the front page of the Sunday newspaper. We interviewed the candidates who were running for governor. And all of a sudden, I'm getting phone calls from people who see me on TV and they go, man, I heard what you said on TV tonight. I loved it. That was great. And uh, nice. nobody else in the household really liked these 930 phone calls. But I was kind of tickled by it. Right. Um, so I wound up going to the local Republican breakfast and everybody's like, hey, it's the guy on TV. You were great. So I, I walk into this like breakfast meeting of the local Republican Party, had like 70 people there, and they all knew who I was. Wow. And they're like, why aren't you a member of the party? We got to get you signed up. So, um, so then I started volunteering on some campaigns and hanging out, and 
talking to elected officials and walking door knocking with politicians. Is this when um, the whole Ollie North and Chuck Robb thing came along? No, Ollie North was back in 1994. Um, oh, so that was way before that. Yeah, but and I had gone, I, I had met Ollie North on that campaign. Uh, okay. he, had a, he had a big event at Regent University I went to, and I shook his hand. He autographed a t-shirt. and I have no idea where that t-shirt is. <laughs> I've met Ollie North many times since then, but, you know, and, and still, I'm not thinking this is a career move for me. I'm thinking, okay, I can volunteer on some campaigns. and Right. I've got a full-time job, and I can do some, I can hang out with the political people. This is pretty cool. Right. So two years after 97, Bob McDonald, who went on to became our, become our governor, right. uh, was my delegate. He had the number one contested race in 1999 at that time. And it was our district where we lived. Right. And I went and knocked on doors with him three or four times a week for um, May until September, all summer long. Wow. And, you know, half the time you knock on doors, nobody's home. So there's a lot of time to kill. And I must have been the most irritating person in the world because I asked him everything. You know, how do you design a piece like this? How do you decide what to write on it? Um, you know, I studied polling in college. How, what's a real poll look like? Can you show me one of your polls? Uh, <laughs> how do you do? I was the first tracker ever. I went to his opponent's press conference and held a video camera in front of his face while he was making his speech, um, just to get him on video, hope, hoping he would say something stupid. Uh, wow. It was, it was just great. And even then, I'm like, this is never going to be a job. Two years later, 2001, somebody running for office said, you know, I talked to Bob McDonald, and he said you were a big help to him. I'd like you to help on my campaign, and I'll pay you. Okay. I could make money at this? Well, this is cool. Of course, I knew nothing. We lost so bad. I was like, well, okay, this was the quickest career in the world. Well, you were like, I know how to go door to door. Let's try that. <laughs> right. Well, what it is, is I, I learned really quickly what doesn't work. All this stuff that I thought campaigns were about, if I'm watching Fox News, and if there was a Fox News back then, and what I think politics and campaigns are all about i had no idea but i knew the stuff that was garbage right um, so i worked on two campaigns the following year and won one of them and then two campaigns the following year lost both of them right and then in 2004 i took a guy who had no chance to win nobody picked to win everybody loved him but there was no way in heck he had any kind of a chance of winning but he hired me and let me run the show i wasn't just part of the team i ran the team uh and we won we got outspent five to one and beat an incumbent the only incumbent to lose that year and he was a city councilman and all of a sudden everybody's like how the hell did he win right the candidate, the candidate told everybody it was because of me um so, and I'm still got a full-time job. I'm still, this politics thing is just something I do for extra money on the side. So what were you doing as a full-time job? I was, I was a fundraiser for muscular dystrophy. I, all day long, I was raising money for, for kids. Um, wow. and, but I had, I had nights off and weekends off so I could do whatever I wanted. Like a call center or something? Uh, it wasn't a call center. It wasn't that big, but we, we, we would hold special events. Uh, di you know, dinners and shamrocks at the at the fast food restaurant. And gotcha. We had these campaigns and we had the telephone. So that somehow plays into your career later, though, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, having a background in fundraising doesn't hurt in politics. Schmoozing, um, you mean? <laughs> I'm a horrible schmoozer. Fundraising. <laughs> and, and I don't know if I'm any good at fundraising, too. I was good enough then. Um, but what happened was a guy named David who owned a PR company said, why are you working like odd campaigns here and there? Come work for me and run a bunch of campaigns. And, you know, not just one because you got a full-time job and you can just do politics on the side. What if this was your job? 
I'm like, there's no way I can make a living on this. Um, but he said, no, 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 this was 2005. And he said, no, come along. I've got, I've got non-political clients. When there's not a campaign, you'll have PR work to do for me. But I want you to run your, your campaigns and I want you to do as many campaigns as you want in my, cur in my firm. And it just it just blasted off from is there. That, but is that purely local, or did have you gone yeah. regional? I always wanted to go. You know, the farthest away I ran a campaign was in Lynchburg. I always wanted to go. You know, I I'm going to go to D.C. to state. Run, yeah. So I started local, and I pretty much figured out how many campaigns I had to work for a decent salary, and without overloading myself. I right. didn't want to. You know, I didn't want to hire a staff. I was staff at that point. I right. figured, you know, five or six is my maximum. Any more than that, and I'm not really doing a good job for the clients. because I, got I mean, to five or six campaigns that you're running the whole show. Well, I'm never running the whole show. And okay. here's the difference. Here's, and here's the difference that nobody ever, ever, ever understands. There's the difference between a campaign manager and a consultant. The campaign manager works on one campaign full time from beginning to end. And they run everything. Candidates in charge. Gotcha. Cam campaign manager manages the nuts and bolts of a campaign. <clears throat> the consultant is somebody who's working a multitude of other races. They're not full time with a campaign, but they're on call. Gotcha. And, and they advise on things like electoral strategy and messaging. What do we run on? What don't we run on? Um, what's popular, what's not popular, how, how, do, how do we position our candidate as compared to our opponent, um, how do we prep for debates, do we buy TV, do we buy radio, do we do direct mail, how do we spend our money, what's our campaign budget, uh, if we have X amount of dollars, what do we spend it on, what makes the most sense. That's so you, all. But you kind of look at it from the big picture where the manager is to having to micromanage everything. Yeah, like the campaign manager manages the candidate's schedule, knows where he needs to be and when he needs to be there. Uh, the consultant is more, you know, top view. You know, I, my, the, my most common phone call that I get is, you know, the newspaper's calling. What do you think they're calling about? <laughs> and I have to mm -hmm. prep the candidate for what we guess the newspaper's probably talking about. Oh, geez. Usually, and usually it's pretty. So your main responsibility really is to stay informed. Yeah. Because <laughs> well, because they asked me, oh, my gosh, they're talking about they're talking about the parole board. Well, I got to know all the issues with the parole board if I'm going to come up with a, a soundbite talking point in five seconds about right. an issue that just came up. So, I've, I, you know, I'm reading five or six newspapers a day while I've got uh, the national news on the TV behind me with the volume. Um, gotcha. Or, you know, I've got to live this thing 24 seven because one of my clients in the middle of a campaign is going to get called by somebody and they're going to say, okay, well, what's, you know, what's this $200 per gun tax that Biden's talking about? Is, right. Is the, the NRA called me and they want to know what I think about it. So I can't say, well, let me look that up and I'll get back to you. The worst case scenario is if I don't know anything about it, I'm, I'm Googling while I'm on the phone. Right. So, um, usually in politics, you know, kind of figuring out where your positions are issue by issue isn't really hard. One of the things I always say is it, it's, it's not so much what you say about issues, it's what issues do you talk about. The issues, right. you, the issues you highlight are almost more important about what you think about those issues. Um, because it strategically sets up the us versus them. Uh, and you want to run on issues that benefit your side rather than issues that may benefit your opponent. And so, but you perfectly establish, uh, perfect, perfectly purposefully establish an us versus them mentality totally. to your campaign. Complete. Really? Because, because there can't be two winners. It's a zero sum game in politics. Somebody, somebody can vote for my candidate or somebody can vote for the other candidate. Can't vote for both of us. Right. So in an election. Now, governing. Is so is different. that where uh, is that where certain integrities go out the window? 
because I always assumed that it was like big money, but I guess if you just have to pick an issue and stick to it, regardless of what your personal ethics might be on it, like that happens, right? They just kind of get pigeonholed into a specific- You can, well, you can. And, and, and this is why I really, really try to advise people against that. And I really, before I sign up with a candidate, I really talk, in, talk them into uh, where I think their campaign should go and where their really heart, real heart and soul is. Because if they try to fake it, I don't think it works. If they try to run on something they really don't care about, just because they think it'll win, people will see through that. Right. You know, if well, somebody especially, to, I guess, at the level that you're talking, right? You're talking about mayor's office to like city councilman, like you said. Well, I'll give you an example. If somebody says that, you know, somebody says, if some consultant says you've got to run this this campaign on Second Amendment issues, the candidate's never touched a gun in his life, uh, has no idea how to use a firearm, has never tried, has no interest in becoming a gun owner, and they're going to run on Second Amendment issues, it's not going to work. Right. Um, so where you kind of find it, and I, and I kind of make a, met, a matrix for candidates, you find what the candidate's really passionate about, and you find what issues are the most beneficial to run on in this campaign. Right. Not just are they popular, not just do people side with us, but are they issues that make the opponent look bad? And, and, that, and then, then you do a cross tab. And then you're like, okay, candidate really believes in these five issues. These five issues are the issues that this, the candidate should run on in this race. If they're not on both lists, cross them off. Gotcha. But then so, what happens if, like, say you have a candidate who is pro-choice, but they have to run a uh, an opposing campaign to... Huh, uh, wow. My mind what do you mean? You mean it's like... A, I, like they're I against the. I, I think I know you. They have to run a campaign against abortion, but they're actually pro-choice. Well, they won't run a campaign against abortion, but if they're if if you're in a race where most of the if just say it's a Republican, there's a right. pro-choice Republican, and they have to, and most of the Republicans voting are pro-life. Right. So you got that problem. There we go. Pro-life. That's the. Keyword I was looking for. One thing you don't do is lie. And right. You don't, you don't say you're pro life when you really are. Because then people are going to ask you to expound on that. And it's not going to work. It'll show all over their faces. But what I have had candidates do who are pro choice in how to get pro life votes is you try to figure out a way that super conservative folks can understand where they are on that issue. And not like it, but accept it. Like I, I, it wasn't my client, but I've seen people who are pro-choice pro -choice Republicans, and they say, "Look, I'm a small government kind of person. I think government shouldn't be in your business. I don't think government should be in your life. And I don't think government should be in anybody's bedroom or anybody's doctor's office. I'm against Obamacare, and I'm against government telling anybody whether they 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 have they have no right to." to stick their nose into a doctor's office or a woman's health decisions. I want government out of everything. Gotcha. So you play like the personal privacy angle and then you throw on top of it the stuff that they do agree with you on <laughs> and move on. And then you shut up and then you don't talk right. about it. Right. That, that, that's definitely say, the political way. <laughs> you just say, you know, you hate government, I hate government. And I just think that I, you know, I don't want Joe Biden and Ralph Northam just making abortion decisions. I want women to make that choice and I want to stay out of it. Right. Um, and that's it. And it's exactly right. I know these people are anti-government, so I will layer the messaging with things they agree with to bring them to some kind of acceptance for something we disagree on and almost say, look, we agree on so much. We don't agree on this. But we've got to beat the other side. Right. Absolutely. So, and again, that's a it's a messaging technique that you kind of sniffed out pretty pretty easily. Um, but it's difficult. It's because not every not every candidate 
it's cookie cutter. And you say, you, your first question, what does it mean to be a Republican? And it's almost like, what does it mean to be a Democrat? Because uh, if you saw the Democratic primary, you saw you know Bernie Sanders calling himself a Democrat and Joe Biden calling himself a Democrat and everybody in between. And they didn't right. agree on everything. There's just different demographics for every person. You know, and we, you know, <laughs> and, you know, and we had, we have, we have Republicans who are John Kasich and we have Republicans who are Ted Cruz right? and, and everything in between. So, um, and there are some people that think that, you know, it's all one big scam and Republicans and Democrats are so much alike that it's not even worth fighting over. You know, whoever's in charge, it doesn't make a difference. The same stuff happens. So I'm not that cynical, but, um, but there are people that just think they're two wings of a, of the same bird. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, does it really matter if it's a Republican or a Democrat in office? Does it really matter if it's Mitt Romney or Barack Obama? Um, I don't know. Well, I think the collective group conscience is going to end up being what actually makes the decision, right? Uh, ultimately, I mean, well, I don't know. Trump's kind of disproved some of that. It seems like whatever his conscience is, generally ends up being the collective group conscience these days at least in the senate well that's that well that's that's true of every political party you know when Reagan right. was president it was reagan's party when clinton was president it was clinton's party you know when the bushes were president it was their party and when the, you know, barack obama became the democratic party wherever whoever the president is they pretty much define Own the, the party. party right right that's true um it's going to be interesting with Trump uh, pretty much uh, collectively, everybody has, has, has figured that he's going to be a one-term president. Now that Trump is off, um, where does the Republican go from here? Where does the Republican Party go without Trump in the White House? Because uh, prior to Trump coming along, this wasn't, it wasn't the same Republican Party that it's been for the last four years. Yeah, definitely not. Um, so what do you think what are the major differences that stick out to you from kind of Trump's views versus like general Republican Party views because I mean like you said their opinions individually vary but Republicans as a whole kind of have a at least a general guidelines to what you know the majority of Republicans believe right the big difference has been in international and mostly international economic issues. There are a whole lot of Republicans who really don't have a problem with immigration. Um, there are a whole lot of Republicans who think that immigration means cheap labor for business. Good right. for business. Uh, there are a lot of Republicans, and, and, and but the Trump Republicans make uh, illegal immigration almost a a uh, defining issue that we are the law and order party and you can't just walk into a country and get a job that an everyday working citizen who's been here his whole life needs that job and now he's got to compete with somebody who's willing to work for very low wages a fraction um, yeah and uh and all these jobs and 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 jobs that go overseas you know the whole move your air conditioning plant to Mexico or China or something like that, you know, where there's real cheap labor, all the jobs go to all other countries where there's cheap labor. And it just means that there's more Americans who are out of work or underemployed and making less money than they used to. And 30, 30, 40 years ago, one salary could pay the bills for a family. And now two salaries can barely make it. And there's a there there is a divide in the Republican Party of uh, the business community who is willing to look the other way when it comes to illegal immigration, and and Trump's conservatism, which is law and order. If you want to come to this country, you're going to do it legally. You're going to immigrate legally. You're going to get processed, um, and you're not going to just cross the border and get put on welfare. Right. You're, that that's the biggest that's the biggest divide that trump has done in the Republican. i mean i think i think most people who are thinking rationally would agree that we can't just have open borders 
you know, we can't, we can't just let people walk across and have children. And then all of a sudden they're citizens. And then there's this whole, you know, I, I get that, well, but at well, the same the problem time, come, where the problem comes in is what do you do with the people who are already here? There's right. 11, there's 11 or 12 million illegal immigrants here. You can close the border tomorrow, but then what? What do you right. do with the 12 million people who are already here? I mean, round them up, or are you going to look the other way? Or are you going to let them be citizens? Personally, them- I wouldn't just hand them a citizenship, but I, I, I don't know what the actual term means in the the whole political sense, like a path to citizenship. When people say that on the news and shit, I don't know what they mean by that. Maybe there's some subtext. I don't understand. Probably well, so. It's basically, what but you were from saying. From my perspective, a path to citizenship seems like like a literal path to citizenship, like you start paying taxes. I mean, my wife is a permanent resident here. She, if she gets a job, she pays taxes. You know, there, there, especially if you already have a child here, your child is technically a U.S. citizen. Like they're definitely, that seems like a rational approach, right? Right. Like the ripping families company. apart or sending them back right. when you know, they've already established a life here just doesn't seem like a feasible or even especially compassionate approach. Well, the problem was in the 1980s, Reagan did what you're saying. Um, Reagan signed an amnesty bill where they said, okay, we're going to shut down the borders. We have an agreement. We're going to close the borders uh, to any illegal crossings. Um, But anybody who's here, you've got amnesty. You're a citizen. You're fine. Nothing bad's ever going to happen to you. They just never closed the border. So the, the pushback that you get from path to citizenship is here we go again. Right. We've heard this before. We're going to, okay. Even though Reagan was a Republican. Yeah. It's like, uh, as soon, you're never really going to close the borders. You're going to give amnesty to 12 million people and they'll have a path to citizenship and they'll be voters and, 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 and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Um, but you're still going to let illegal immigrants come in because they'll work for wages even lower than all these new citizens will. Uh, so you, they, they really don't trust government when they say, well, we'll, we'll close the border this time. And, and this time we mean it. And plus they're, they're and, and there's, a, there's, and the Trump Republicans that- are kind of like the Trump Republicans would say, aren't you just rewarding them for breaking the law? They came to America illegally. They broke our law. They came in here, they, they, they came into America while other people are waiting in line to come here legally. They came here by themselves illegally. And now you're just going to reward them with a path to citizenship. Like, see, it was worth it to do. It was worth it to do something illegal because it worked out in the end. And, and they're like, should we really be rewarding people who cross the border illegally? That's, that's the debate in a Republican party. Yeah, I mean, it almost, but the saying it like that almost sounds like we don't negotiate with terrorists, right? It's like, well, they did it illegally, so we're not even going to talk about it, just send them back. You know, I, I, I get that line of thinking. And the argument is it doesn't solve the problem. But don't, wouldn't you say today that we have a better capacity to actually guard the border? Like if we made a real tactical force behind it, real money, you know, obviously it costs real money. And then the question becomes, where does that real money come from? Okay. Bedtime? <laughs> yep. Nice. Um, and, but yeah, so then the question becomes, where does that real money come from? Right. right. But, I, but at and, the same time, like, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say that we have the capacity to do that? To actually effectively, for the most part, well, there's a lot of things we have the capacity to do that just never happen. We have the capacity to balance the budget. It doesn't happen. Right. A lot of people make promises. Um, we do have the capacity to close the border, and Trump has has really done more than any president I've seen in actually closing off significant parts of the border, at least the ones that, that were used in significant um that doesn't really include the building of a, 170 yards of wall or whatever. They never broke the entire wall. Um, but that was his thing. It was, uh, and, and that was, that, that was his, we have to stop people from coming here illegally. Right. And make them come 
you make them come legally, make them immigrate through the legal process. Um, but isn't it counterintuitive? I mean, it just seems completely, completely counterintuitive to think that a wall is going to stop the problem of illegals. I mean, well, if you really want to get into it, um, and I've had, this, thing, tunnels, I've had this debate gonna... before, and, and it's not just that. Um, the number one source of illegal immigrants in this country are people who overstay visas, not people yeah. who cross the border. Yeah, no doubt, which means so they people, came legally. They came legally on work visas or school visas visas or something like that. Visitors visas, yeah. And then all of a sudden they poof, you know, right. six months is up and they're somewhere and right. they're not leaving. I mean, that's the safest way, right? Rather than taking a coyote, oh, you're oh taking God. your chances crossing the border in Texas or yeah, yeah. Arizona or California. You get, a, you get a work visa, you cross the border. New Mexico. Then you quit the job and you move to another state. And they never find you. Again. So, right. uh, so well, I guess right. there's a so whole right. underground network for them to get credentials. So, and, so security cards. And right. IDs that look real to anybody. Yeah. Um, and uh, and they never and and you know a wall had nothing to do with them. They came in on an airplane, so um, so you're right. It's it's you know even if somebody did what they campaigned on and built a wall um, from the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific Ocean, it's not the only way people get in here. And I mean, what would it stop? Ten percent of crossings, <laughs> like you're not crossings, but. Well, or even then, let's just talk maybe, specifically maybe to crossings. Yeah. It might half. I think half is generous. Yeah. I think half yeah. suggests that half of those people don't give half of a shit about why they were leaving in the first place. They're going to find a way to get over the wall, whatever okay, they got to do, whether the they got to build ladders out of cardboard or what, like they're going to find a way. And, and it's funny, go to Europe and try to cross the border. Good luck. <laughs> what do you mean? If you don't have a visa, you're not crossing. You try to cross. You try to get into Italy or France or Germany um, without a without a travel visa. You know they may not have a wall. It's 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 I not mean, just it's not countries don't let people just walk into them. I don't know if any of those countries have the same level of illegal immigration that we do because they're part of the EU for one, but also. Across the I'm border sure they North have Korea just as many South open Korea. borders as we do. So if Germany was like Latvia's ideal destination for running away, then I'm sure all Latvians would find a way to get into Germany. It wouldn't, they're not going to cross at a border crossing, right? Same is true here. I mean, you, you could say, you know, that you're talking about people that try to go through general customs. Like if somebody wanted to cross the border into Germany, they'd They'd find a way to walk through the woods or go over a mountain or whatever it took. Actually, if, we're, if, we're it, if it of, meant, you know, kind of, prosperity. We're kind of simplifying it because most, most of those kind of crossings are, are people who claim asylum. They, 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 they claim that they're being persecuted by the country they're leaving. Right. So they, they seek asylum in the, in the country. So if somebody somebody's trying to sneak out of Germany in the 1940s, trying to get to to Italy or France, uh, it would be, uh, they, they'd claim political asylum and they wouldn't be just a, an illegal immigrant. That's right, all. and there'd be a sort of path for them that was actually right. sufficient, right? Yeah, or we even have if too. they had to claim refugee status or whatever. Right. Right. Um, but then, a lot of you, know, you know, you can say a bunch of, uh, you can talk about the EU all you want, but the word refugee has been around in, uh, in politics for the last couple of years. Uh, lot of debates over which country takes refugees um, oh yeah no doubt from countries that are at war countries in famine countries that have political uprising um and those and there are refugees um spread out over the world and there's debates and discussion about you know which countries take them and how many do they take and all that oh stuff. yeah 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 i've heard all i've heard a lot of those discussions and right. honestly i understand like especially that is a very tough tough conversation to have i mean yeah you got people that that are just people you know that just i mean they're all people right but you you have people that are gonna enter your country and do good and then you've got people that will definitely enter your country and do bad and then 
how do you weigh all that up? I mean, that's oh, I definitely, yeah. uh, it's a I tough to conversation to have. Years, and, you go back a hundred years and they, you know, and when Ireland was in pretty bad economic straits, a bunch of Irish that came into Massachusetts and, and New York and Philadelphia, uh, I'm probably, you know, my roots are probably sport. in there. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you think the term paddy wagon came from? Right. Uh, but, but the, uh, and I'm not kidding about that, uh, but no, you know, so a bunch of like Italian, a, a bunch of Irish refugees, you know, the, the sign, no Irish need apply. Um, there is always a, a bit of pushback with uh, with people who are claiming asylum or refugee sat status or leaving leaving a country with bad economic times to come well, see, to when you weigh that like conversation America. versus the immigration conversation the immigration conversation seems easier yeah it, does. <laughs> it really does because Ref refugees bring a whole different spin to the, to the refugees is a essentially a pandora's box right you're opening it up and you have no idea what chaos lie within. No, the, not really. The no. majority, but the they, vast majority the of argument. immigrants that are here are not rapists and drug dealers and this and that. They are people who are trying to have a better life. And so, I've said this yeah, a few times on this everybody topic. Quotes, and, you say again? the Statue of Liberty and you can end the argument right there. Say again? You could quote the Statue of Liberty you and have the, the argument. It's like yeah, yeah, a, I've, I've actually your done board, that. You're tired. Yeah. yeah. I've done that. And, and I, you know, but that, I mean, that's the refugee argument too. Right. Um, and, and from that position, I agree. And, you know, with the refugees, I think we need a whole other set of things, but as far as the immigrants are concerned, um, being someone who's gone through the immigration process with my wife and done it legally and brought her here from England. It isn't it, very, isn't it an easy process? It is not an easy process and it's <laughs> crazy point. strenuous. And, you know, we were constantly on further. the edge I of think, our seats and we are not even, we're law abiding far. citizens, you know? So we will even like, go as far as to say that the, le the legal immigration process, it's been like this for a long time. The legal immigration process is so bad, it encourages illegal immigration. Exactly. And that's what I'm getting at. It's really unaccessible. If I was a single mother of three children and I wanted a better life for my kids and I live in Mexico and I want to get my sons away from gang life and this and that, I don't have an option. If I, especially if I don't meet Trump's new like credit system or whatever, you know, you have to you have merit system. Let me stand in line and maybe in 10 years. No. Right. And then two, one thing that really threw my wife and I is that he changed a law around uh, when immigration makes a ruling on your case, they no longer have to provide you a reason for why they've denied you, they just deny you. So it used to be they had to give you a reason and then you could make whatever corrections were necessary. Now, I guess it's just up to you to know what it was that you know causes a denial. In our case, we if we would have been denied for something and that were the case, I mean, we would have, we're law abiding citizens. Like what have we done wrong? And then you got to probably petition for some other for the information as to why you were denied, you know, or you got to take legal action to figure out like that stuff gets crazy expensive and even more inaccessible. So I've just, I firmly believe that there should be a much more accessible path to working here at the very least. Right. Right. And something that encourages people to use that system. Okay. I can get in just based off the fact that I have no criminal background, this and that, you know, still do background checks and all of that stuff. I mean, I realize that requires resources, but if you, I think we spend a lot more resources on illegal immigration <laughs> than if we just made a path that was accessible. Right. Nobody's ever, when, when talking about the federal government, nobody's ever used the word efficient. I mean, so that kind of brings me to the next topic that I have here. And I, the other day, I've had it in my head for a while now that I wanted to read Common Sense by Thomas Paine. Oh. So I sat down and I started to read it and I haven't finished it yet, but 
I'm probably halfway through. And it have you ever read it? Yeah, the uh, the the first written form of American populism. It's, uh, it, it's literally one of the most beautiful things I've ever read. A anything nonfiction, right? <laughs> like, it was so I, I took a quote from here. I, I, I took a whole bunch of quotes, but we could spend two hours going over just quotes that I pulled just out of the first half. You're gonna, you're but gonna have I took to change the name here. of your podcast to Common Sense. Well, I'm actually debating on doing a whole separate series and modernizing his version of Common Sense because of some of what I'm about to ask you here on okay. on this. So, um, hold on, just. A So this quote here, <laughs> I, I, I just, I want to read it and I want to see if you feel like it applies today like I feel like it applies today. So quote, to say that the Constitution of England is a union of three powers reciprocally checking each other is farcical. Either the words have no meaning or they are flat contradictions. So I understand that there is an absolute degree of checking that goes on between our three bodies of government. But would you not say that the legislative branch has kind of the, the strongest hold on all of us because of their inability to make decisions? Well, number one, the legislator, the legislator, the legislature has the biggest hold on all of us when it comes to government because that's the way our government was designed. It's not true in 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 in, in England of the parliamentary system. Um, you don't like the prime minister; they just have a vote of no confidence, throw the prime minister out and elect him. Right. The uh, but you know our first, if you go to the Constitution, Article One is about um. You know, it's the three branches of government, and uh, in Article One, it's the legislature, it's the House of Representatives and the Senate, um, and it, then it goes to the executive. So, in the American design, president isn't um, isn't all powerful and in charge of everything. Well, hundred um, percent on purpose, and of course, this purpose, reference yeah. is referencing that the king has the most power, and it's right. like beyond anything that's comprehensible if you feel like all men are equal right, right? And, Payne, and, uh, and and pain 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 said uh you know, you're 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 fooling yourself if you think that england is co-equal branches of government with checks and balances because they don't. right that's what it that's what i was just quoting exactly uh, and but, I, but of course he uses many many examples as to why he feels that way like that's all pretty much at least what the very beginning of common sense is all where about. I part with you is where you said about today's in a bit today's inability to get things done right because that kind of gridlock is exactly what people like thomas paine wanted if if you were complaining that federal government can't get anything done people like thomas paine would say hot damn it work because that's what we wanted right you know we wanted it to be so tough for those federal folks in government to get anything done that there could be no tyranny in the united states right because because nobody can get something from one end of pennsylvania avenue to another and the smallest government is the best government so i would think that thomas Paine would like gridlock and the inability for us to get anything done because I, I mean, in, I would say in colonial times, on, they want they wanted the states to have the power, not the federal government. I would say entirely based on everything I've read up to this point, that is exactly the opposite to what he wants. Because when it comes to policies and especially creating a new government, he wanted to focus on what was common about us. 
that was the whole point, like to, to put your prejudices aside and let's focus on the fact that the king is indifferent to us, that he he doesn't know anything about us because he's all the way over there. He doesn't know what we need. He doesn't know what we want. And, and, we, can, and we can govern our own affairs. And, and he even made a point of saying that not even a third of the population of Pennsylvania was even English at that point because of all of the immigration that had taken place. So <laughs> the Pennsylvania Dutch. The, but the point being that his his entire, I mean, I can, hold on. So here, in the following sheets, the author has hath studiously avoided everything which is personal among ourselves. That's a quote like that he wrote <laughs> so he he purposefully left out all the personal stuff so that they could come to an agreement yeah and, right? and and one of one of and see this um one of Payne's ideas is is it, it it was the first kind of a idea and they didn't call this back i don't know when they started with this term but it's the idea that melting pot like we're not all from England. Why is the king governing us? Right. We have we have French, we have Spanish, we have German, we have people from Holland, people from all over Europe are in this country. Why why are we subjects of the king? Because right. he owns the land. Um, he's an ocean away from us. He doesn't give a darn about us. He just wants to tax us. And, uh, and, and so that was, that was part of the, uh, when he makes it personal, it's, it's, there is a breed of nationality here that's called Americans. Right. We're not British subjects. We're not subjects of the British crown. We've kind of spawned our own thing here. We don't know what American is, but it's, it's not French and it's not Spaniard and it's not Italian and it's certainly not British it's it's Ben Franklin well and he points out that. he points out that the relationship that they have to England is nothing but a disadvantage like there's no single advantage to continuing to have a relationship with England because everything that they drag themselves into they drag us into and you know Yes, we without get them, we still have all this benefit. We can still have a world stage. We can still, you know, communicate. And that was the, ar that was the argument for, for the people who wanted to stay with England. England still had the, the largest navy in the world. And the idea was no foreign country would attack the Americas as long as they were under British rule. And once the British were not protecting us, uh, it would be open season on, on other, uh, other nations to come and... Uh, plunder the land which is right why, uh, which is why they they worked so closely with france and with spain during the revolutionary war to build relationships but for that very reason because uh, well and i guess at a time when you don't have a very stable even army right uh, so the army was the militia well, you learn about right talk about the well, not even the militia just separate militias separate, yeah <laughs> every, town had its own, every town had its own militia and uh and that's that's what the uh that's what fought the revolutionary war it was no right war. and uh they did raise an army and washington was the leader of the army but it had very little funds and you know it was militia members who fought the various battles uh, and they and, and, but there was a big fear by those that say you know we should we should redress our grievances with the British Crown, but not leave them, because without their protection, we're it, it's going to be open season on us. Um, despite right. the fact that uh, you know no colony had ever uh, rebelled against uh, a home nation before, so we were kind of uh, yeah, kind of doing something that was never done before. Um, but but. Uh, yeah, I mean, the concerns by the loyalists were definitely warranted, especially when it came to taking on a superpower like England, right? And Payne was, uh, but Payne was doing like you were talking about earlier about how we message things um, and, and how you layer in things that you know um, people will personally agree with when you're making your argument. 
Right. What he's definitely saying there is he's speaking to people who, who do feel like um, that, the, that the king is indifferent to them. King knows nothing of us. King doesn't even care who we are or what we do. But wouldn't you say the same is true of governors or even of senators and well that's the argument you only see them around election time do they really care about you do they do anything for you of course um, they don't except when and that that's vote. what i was getting at with my point about the legislative branch having too much power this gridlock is caused by them and their agendas and all this picking backing bills on top of bills that have nothing to do with the bill that's being put forward that actually everybody needs right now or you know, not necessarily referring specifically to this stimulus package, but any no, and, and, and no, and riders drive people crazy. Um, so how do <laughs> I mean? It's a guaranteed. I guess they way need a whole new debate to do away with those, right? Yeah, absolutely. In Virginia, Virginia state government does have that law. They have a single issue law where, you know, an amendment cannot amendment must be germane to the main bill. You can't attach things in, in the state government of Virginia that were irrelevant to the bill. Um, right, so, so what are what is to stop them from doing that in the House and the Senate? Nothing, because there's every benefit in the world to keeping doing it. They, there, there's no, there is no negative other than running up the debt, which it contributes to. Um, if, you're, if you're a congressman and you need funding for something in your district, to get it is if they attach it to some very important bill that has nothing to do with your district. Right. That's the way you're going to. Uh, that's the way you're going to get it. And uh, and, and say la vie. That's how you. Uh, you're like, well, I got to bring home the bacon for my district, and it become the ends justifies the means. I don't like the way I got the funding, but I got the funding. And at the and end of the day, the people back home are the people back home are going to care more that I got the funding and how I got it. And that's going to, so if you were to split them all up into individual bills, most of those kind of things wouldn't happen because the that whole majority of the house would be like, well, we don't, we don't have the I funding care, to appropriate Montana for wildlife conservation. I don't you care know. about Montana. I don't have any voters in Montana. What do I care about them? Right. It's into horse trading. I'll vote for yours if you vote for mine. So you think that's the major thing that keeps riders in the mix too, that I, I was thinking like maybe one logical thing would be that it would take more time to kind of parse it all out on an individual well, basis, but it would and it wouldn't, right? Certain things would be like, okay, that's done, you know, but other things would be like, this is contentious, <laughs> you know, well, we're going yeah. to argue about this for the next thousand years, like Palestinians well, and Israelis, rather than like try to come up with a common or cooperative solution, like you said, we're going to pick a side, you're going to pick a side, and we're just going to argue over it forever. Right, see, uh, and that's nay, what they, nay, do nay. <laughs> they do in state government is uh, all the innocuous stuff that nobody really opposes, you know, they, they'll, they'll, pass, they'll pass 50 or 60 bills in one vote. It's like, okay, there's no objection to any of this. And they get a whole bunch of stuff done, and they save the arguing for the contentious thing. Right. It happens every day at the state level, but um, with Congress, everything's wrapped up in the big omnibus bills because um, it moves so slowly. So, and that's why it takes passing things at the state level to ever bring any change to federal government, right? Like right. marijuana, for instance, they got to pass it all over the country before they can pass it federally. Same with what gay marriage, gay rights, like. They got to pass it state by state until they got enough states to actually push and enough population to be like, we want this, you know. So, and, and to be honest with you, it's almost like the system is designed for that. I mean, people have called, I don't remember who came up with it in the beginning, but people have called the United States 50 laboratories. You got 50 state governments where they can experiment with everything from, from gay marriage to abortion procedures to, uh, what was the other thing that you said? Um, marijuana legislation. Right, right. Let the states work it out and figure out what works, what doesn't work. And states start copying each other and improving on each other's ideas. And by the time there's some critical mass of, okay, we've got this figured out, then it goes to the federal level. 
ideally, I think it actually works better that way because you get to field test these things and make corrections before the federal government comes in and says, boom, this is the law for everybody. If it did it in reverse where the federal government just said, this is the way it's going to be, take it or leave it. Well, well then that would definitely law. be too much power in the hands of right. some branch, well, right? Well, I think bubbling things bubbling up from the state level is actually a good thing. I think that's why we're the United States and not one big country, America, where why we're 50 states and not just one, not just Canada. You know what I mean? Right. So why do you think government and government related classes in school are not geared toward teaching you the value of your vote and the value of our freedoms? Right. Why? They teach us about them and they teach us that we have this right. And oh, well, cool, I, I can vote been. when I'm 18, but you don't know what it means. I haven't been in a school in a real long time. Right. Fair enough. But, but it wasn't went, any different back then than it was. When I went but when I went to school back there, my I looking back, I'm in the industry now. Looking at what I wasn't taught is amazing. Because when I was in school, all my political classes were essentially history classes. It had nothing to do with, uh, it had nothing to do with, I don't know. Hello. Hello. The, uh, where were we there? It had nothing to do with I like civics and government. It was just oh, yeah, history. When I was yeah, when I was when I was in school, all all the government classes you didn't get them until you were well well into high school. Um, they were taught like history classes. It was what date did this happen, and who you know what was the name of the person that did this. And it really wasn't a debate or discussion about what it all means. Right. Why is it so important? It's just it's it was just it was his, it was basically history, but it was called government. Exactly. Um, you know, Same for me, and I just go in the I blank. So how, bored how, of how it. Blank, you know, and and, it, and they wrap yourselves around the axle about memorizing the names and the dates and and the Federalist Papers and what did Federalist Thirty Seven say versus Federalist Forty One. Right. But I didn't get to college before we had a debate over why is this important? What does this matter? Why did they do it this way instead of another way? Um, and you know. And when I went to college, it was uh, an extreme minority of people who had college degrees. So it's not, you know, it, for the for the general voter, they don't get that. Right. Even even my Amer my American government class was required as a senior. It was really just glorified history. So what if uh, what if for the whole piggybacking issue? they put like a cap on the number of bills that were allowed to be presented and, at once. And again, states do that. Virginia does that. Right. They put a cap on how many bills a legislator can introduce. Well, in that case, it's only one, right? In Virginia's? No, 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 no. Um, they, every bill has to have a single purpose, um, but uh, you'll see some legislators with 30 or 40 bills. And, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, but I don't mean a number of bills that you can put forth as a pursuant. I mean the number of bills that you can attach, like to a bill. Oh yeah, no, you can just say no, and that's the thing. It's called the germaneness rule, and Congress would be amazingly efficient if they, and 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 I think uh, they'd get closer to a balanced budget if they did that. But if they passed a rule that, you know. Any amendment or uh, or any rider, anything you attach to a bill has to be germane to the main purpose of the bill. Or it's struck. And the Speaker of the House can strike a, an attachment that's non germane. I mean, even if they attach the something that wasn't, that had nothing to do with the bill, like what if they just had a cap on the number of riders you could attach? Right. Well, that would be a step. Huh? That would be a step in the right direction. Right. Part, I mean, you can your rider can be about whatever you want it to be, but you can only have five of them. Well, that, and just like I mean, you got this 
in the news this fall was a, a whole the definition of a writer and why people hate them is the the House of Representatives the House of Representatives stimulus bill was held up because Nancy Pelosi wanted to add a rider about voter ID laws. And people right. were like, what does voter ID have to do with COVID stimulus? Right. Uh, and and the, the public outcry was so bad in the Senate basically said, we're not passing that and it just kind of died. The House passed it and it didn't go anywhere. You can, you can load up these bills with so much stuff. And if you can make the public care um, you can get pushback in, 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 in the, and the bill doesn't go anywhere. Um, if nobody wants to say, a, have a germaneness rule for riders, the least they can do is limit how many they can, they can put on. And then you got to decide what that number is. So why, like, 435 say, members of the House. It's a, all the money that flies around in politics, especially at that level, um, why aren't there more localized campaigns to sway public opinion it, do you get what i mean by that so like you're trying to pass this bill and you know that incumbents from montana oppose this bill why is there not money like dumped into there montana is. there is um and uh want to see money spent, look at whenever there's a Supreme Court nomination. And look at the money that's spent in the states where the, the members of the Senate Judiciary Committee go. You ever see the TV ad that says, call congressman so-and-so and let them know what you think about this. Well, that's, that's some political action committee in char that, that cares about a special interest that says, call your congressman and tell them you oppose this. Or offshore right. drilling. There's They're a, taking polls on the public opinion, and they'll do. You'll you'll you, you may see some direct mail go out to people in in a congressional district, paid for by some special interest group trying to say, call your congressman and tell them to oppose this bill. There are telephone, right, I've heard you know, that. There, there there's social media stuff, but the the, the the most obvious ones are the TV ads. Because right. they won't, because they aren't about elections. They don't say vote for him or don't vote for her, or anything like that. But they say call your congressman and tell them to oppose the offshore drilling ban. We need jobs in Virginia. Right. That's practically right. So there are a lot of about these this, these legislation stuff like that. The reason there's not more of them is because number one, it's expensive, and right. number two, it takes time to put those things together. By the time you know, you don't want to spend three months working on an advertising campaign for a bill, and then you know, have it die right when you're about to run your ads, and, right? Or, or have it passed before you get to launch your effort. So um, you got to make sure that the, the that when you're when you're involved in issue advocacy, which is what it's called, um, that you time it right and you make sure that you're juice is worth the squeeze as we say in the business that you're actually going to have an impact on somebody and not right. be too early or too late or you know attack a bill that's already pronounced dead or uh supporting a bill that's already attacked that, that's already going to die and people call their congressman it doesn't matter uh, so you usually get things like supreme court nominations or you know, you know marijuana legislation or something that's going to take time um so that it's not over before it starts. Right. But there, but you see a lot of it. If you Google issue advocacy, you'll find you'll find a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of firms that do nothing but issue advocacy campaigns, referendum campaigns, petition campaigns, they're all over the place. Right. That's true. Just if you're not in that state or you're not in that district, you don't see it. Makes sense. So what do you think? about mainstream media these days and like social media i think it's gone off the rail and there's two different things um, i know they're two different things but you can attack and you can attack them separately but and it's yeah and it's not much of a you know, not attack I, but right uh i you know dissect them separately <laughs> mainstream media is kind of weird because um they used to own the planet 
mainstream media, if, if, if you weren't watching one of the three networks, you weren't watching TV. You know, if, if you were an advertiser and you wanted to hit males over 35, you know, you advertise on Monday night football and, and then you went to bed because you were done, you reached your audience. Then all of a sudden we've got 500 channels and with, with when cable exploded and now there's so many networks and it's all divided. Sub, you know, who watches USA versus TNT versus Bravo? And now it's not even cable channels. Now it's who watches Hulu or YouTube TV. YouTube. <laughs> and from what uh, I understand, like YouTube is everyone's biggest concern. So you've got the mainstream media that used to be, okay, ABC, NBC, and, and uh, CBS. And then CNN came along. But really, it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't that, there weren't that many major channels. To now, it's when, <clears throat> now it's, uh, you know, not just DVD and Blu-ray and DVR, but it's not just satellite, but with streaming services, how many people watch the quote unquote mainstream media? So everybody had to basically pick a side. Um, but what about like, instead of a bunch of inflammatory talking points, just showing some 15 second clips of cats? <laughs> I hope it's not the movie cats, cause that was horrible. But now, but they could generate uh, views. <laughs> you know, that's what that, that's what generates views, right? Is videos okay, of cats okay, and kids. Follow where I was at. Yeah, you've got you got networks that pretty much own the market. Three or four networks that covered eighty five percent to ninety percent of the American viewers on these few channels. Right now, there's a thousand different channels. How do you get noticed? Show cat videos. No other channel is showing cat videos. And I know Reagan. You gotta, go, you gotta go far, far to the right <laughs> or far, far to the left and say, watch us, we agree with you. And uh and so the old mainstream press, it was liberal, but they tried to be balanced because they didn't need to fight to get the audience. They had the audience. And now they're fighting over a smidgen of the audience. And right. they, they got to make as much noise, get enough attention so that eyeballs turn to their station. Crazy and lunatic and wacko left as they want to be or as hard-nosed wacko right as they want to be. Right. Got to get attention because they have to fight for eyeballs. Because somebody's, somebody's going to be watching cat videos. Do you feel like even for you, it's gotten too out of hand? I mean, you have to watch it regardless, right? Because of what you do. You got to stay up to date, but well, I do, but but it's but when it comes to advertising, it's difficult because I, I need to reach a majority of voters, and if a majority of voters, if 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 adding up if all the people on Fox News don't add up to fifty one percent, I need to advertise on a lot more than Fox News. Where it used to be, all I had to do was run on, you know, network TV, and I'm done. Gotcha. But now, now you I have gotta, to get so much more local. Yeah, I got to run the same ads on, you know, 15 different channels just to get the percentage of audience that one network would have gotten me 20 years ago. And so would it's you not say that, that now I got to run that ad on YouTube and I got to run it on Hulu. Right. Would you say that every time you run a campaign, you've had like either radically opposing or just generally opposing views to that of your candidate? Never really radically, because even in the nonpartisan races, Republican diary, because I'm known as the Republican guy. So I don't really get radical disagreements with people. Right. And, but and this is you're gonna have you're gonna have fun with this. Like, get ready. Here's your show, here's your sound bite. It doesn't matter what I think on an issue. I can't stand consultants that ram their personal political thoughts down the throat of their clients and demand that their clients run on stuff they agree with. Right. My job isn't to agree with my client or to make my client agree with me. My job is to try to position my candidate's messaging to give them the best possibility of winning. Right. Based on how they feel. So if somebody wants to run on a tax cut and I think a tax cut's a dumb idea, I don't care and I don't even tell them. Really? My job is, well, my, that's job not your is job, right? my job is to frame their campaign messaging in a way that makes them look good and their opponent look bad. So what does that do to you 
ethically or morally. I mean, it's your job, but say that like, say that it was something a little more pressing than a certain tax cut or something. You know, just I guess you haven't had that, right? No. Um, and I've been, and you know, when I'm following the Republican side, I'll agree with most of the votes that my client advocates, most of the positions. But again, even if I don't, that's not my job. Um, and it has no problem ethically because I think it's unethical for me to try and change my clients to run on things that I think are, that I care about and to run on my positions. And on their own, right? They're the they're the they're the candidate. They're the name on the ballot. Whether I agree with them or not is irrelevant. Voters right. are voting for the candidate. It's what they think that matters. Now, I can tell them. I can tell them. Look, polling says nobody agrees with you on this issue. You're dumb if you even bring it up. Um, you know, we just we just did a poll about your tax idea and 72% of the voters in the district think you're wrong. And they decide for themselves whether or not to keep saying. Um, <laughs> but for me to say, and I and look, there are consultants all over this business and stuff like that. They only work for people who agree with them. And if their candidates don't say what they want them to, what, what the consultant tells them to say, whether they agree with it or not, then there's a big giant blow up in a fight. And I just, I just hate that because I don't think it works. And, and I, I'm not in this business to elect people who do what I think they should do. Right. I'm do in you this feel business. like Trump had a consultant? I'm sure he had about 500 of them. One every, <laughs> one every day. Um, I, I, I doubt he listened to many of them. I, right. I can, I'd say, you know, the worst, you know, being Trump's consultant would be the worst and best job in the world be the worst because he would never listen to a thing I said, He'd do whatever he wanted regardless. Um, but it would be the best job in the world because it'd be over in a week. It's either <laughs> fired or I'd quit. That sounds like a I've joke had, you've told before. <laughs> a couple but times. I had, I've had, well, I've had, I've had clients like that. And after, you know, if I make recommendations after about five or six recommendations where they say, well, I disagree with you. I start saying, Maybe this, maybe this isn't the campaign for me. Maybe you need a consultant that'll do what you that, that that'll 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 fit your yeah. ideals more. Yeah, because because if I tell you what my advice is over and over and over again, you don't take it. Why are you paying me? Right. You know, if you don't see the campaign the way I do, then no hard feelings. But maybe maybe we should go separate. Way. And it happens. Right. But it's so, not usually about stands on issue. Um, I don't, I don't now, give it, now I don't about give it social media. Now, social media, every campaign changes. Social media has not been the same any election cycle that I've worked in. Right. Um, you know, four years ago, it was uh, social media was the wild, wild west. Right. You could do anything on Facebook. You could do anything on Twitter. It was easy as pie and it was cheap. Right. And people like either accept it or they don't and they look over it and they don't care. But then everything got charged up. Yeah. And then, well, then everybody started doing it. And then all of a sudden restrictions came in and you couldn't do political ads on Twitter anymore. And even Spotify stopped doing it. Uh, and, 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 and Facebook had their restrictions um, where you have to get your content approved before you can run an ad and you could only run it. Like you couldn't run any ads 10 days before election day that aren't, weren't pre-approved, even if they were pre-approved. Uh, this is even for local elections? And YouTube, yeah, anything wow. political. Um, and YouTube, YouTube would uh, take a week to approve an ad that you wanted to run. So, you know, if you were running nine days, you put an ad on YouTube um, and they took 10 days to approve it, you, you're out of luck. Wow. Um, so... And the, the best thing about social media was, and especially Facebook, Facebook is the first social media that had more than 50% of the country with an account. Which right. is huge. You know, Twitter is small, Instagram is small, um, but Facebook was just like everybody. And, 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 and now 
it seems like all the young people have ditched Facebook and everybody who's on Facebook is my age or older. Right. Which are voters. So I mean, I'd say that's pretty true. I not that I I don't really have any friends who are like in their twenties, really. Um, I'm maybe a handful or something that I'm not thinking of. Yeah, I definitely have a handful, but most of my friends are 30 plus, you know, uh, but the Facebook or the, algorithm, age or, or, you know, that's, yeah. The, the Facebook algorithm changed everything. You know, it used to be, if you put a meme on, you got amazing engagement. And it used to be, if you had a picture, you got amazing engagement. Last year, it was if you had a video, you got amazing engagement. And now it's to the point where unless your video is live, you know, if, if it's not a Facebook Live, if it's just an uploaded video, it's so so. Um, right. You know, unless you put some money behind it, it's almost like they're, they're, they're forcing you to do paid advertising because yeah. their algorithm doesn't share your content unless you're paying for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So... So it becomes a different game every year. We have no idea. Well, and now every, pretty much every platform has some way that you can pay for advertising through there. Like if you're a content creator. Yeah. And I take webinars. I take webinars on social media by the really big money people who really invested their careers in social media where they say, okay, here's what the algorithms are, are looking like this year. And here's what they're talking about clamping down on. And here's the best way to get the most out of this platform, that platform, that, you know. You've got to stay completely, you got to keep educating yourself. You know, I may be the one of the oldest social media experts because you just have to keep learning because Twitter changes, Facebook changes. And now, you know, with this new uh, with this with this new thing that everybody's saying they're ditching Facebook to join, and it's really at its infancy stages. Is it going to explode or is it just going to be like the next MySpace? What's it called? I've heard of it. It's the Republican answer to the to Facebook, right? Yeah, I wish I knew. I can't remember now what it's called either. I just saw it the other day. Uh, Parlor. Parlor. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, I got an account on there to kind of see it, and it's like it's like way infancy stages it's really I mean, and right. then congratulations now you're advertising to an echo chamber already <laughs> look there's look and it's well, wasted you, money look, right well depends on what race you're in if you're in a republican primary you want an echo chamber because there's only republicans voting or democrats voting so. but you need to sway the democratic opinion to get your republican desired if you get the nomination if you get the nomination yeah First, you first, first, you got to win a primary. And, true, and, true. You know, I get what you mean. Yeah, so if you're in a Democratic primary, you advertise on MSNBC. You're not getting any Republicans, but who cares? Um, but when the general election comes along, you change your strategy. It's a different argument. So, do you feel like there's any way to either simmer or? to to overcome the polarization that's kind of exploded over the last uh, four years? <laughs> See, here's why, and I have this debate with people. Are things really that much more polarized than they were 20 years ago? Or do we all have social media so that we now know what everybody used to just say to their neighbor? To be fair, I was... 12 20 years ago <laughs> so i didn't have any clue how polarized it might have been back well, then bush versus of course gore. there are always bush, there bush versus issues. gore went to the supreme court so that was pretty polarized there are always issues that are going to be polarizing but i will say i this. think I, I i think what i mean by polarize like how radically it's polarized is that our communication isn't even the same. Like people can barely talk to each other anymore because, you know, like I said in my first video, I share one opinion that's like in favor of Trump or in favor of Biden and then I'm lumped in with these other people, you know. See, where did you share that? Where did you share that opinion? So what do you mean by that? You said you said I shared one opinion about Trump and I got blasted with 
where did you share it? I mean, I, I've done both on social media. Right. I've taken one side or the other and then get blasted for it. Right. And uh, when I was your age, there was no social media. So right. if I said something to my friends about Trump, nobody would know. But as we've discussed, I mean, these are not 20 year olds that I'm arguing with. These are. No, but I'm just saying, no, I'm saying, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going at the age. I'm just saying, are things polarized? Are things more polarized now? Or do we just see everybody's polarization because we have social media? Right. Well, to be fair, I think I remember probably, oh, must have been just over 20 years ago <laughs> you and my great grandma got into a battle in uh in my grandma's house did i win politics <laughs> oh man i was too young to remember that but From i feel California, like i do right? i do recall there being a giant argument i don't remember what the topic was right but i guess oh, well, you know we'll to your on, point we'll yes yes put that on these, social media and a thousand people could see Things have always been polarized, but I will is say there this. a way to quell that radical response? It's kind of tough because social media rewards extremism. But you, know, you put but out when, when both sides, and this is not a just I know, a Republican. I know, and I agree. Both sides are campaigning on radical like ideologies. How do you how can we stop that? You know, like, I feel like both parties kind of owe it to civility and humility and the country to kind of let's stop being okay. these two giantly opposing forces. There are really boring answers to this. One of them is the way we draw districts. If you got if you've got these legislators drawing their district lines every 10 years so that no person from the other party will ever come close to beating them, the only thing they have to worry about is a challenge from their own party. Right. So this is redlining. That so it's a, so it's a, so it's a, it's a built in. If I'm, if I'm a Republican and I'm in an 80% Republican district, I need to be as far right as possible because the only way I lose my seat is if another Republican beats me. So this, this so redrawing of these lines happens every 10 years? Yeah, right after the census. Uh, so the it, basically the, whoever's in the office at the time gets to decide where these lines go? Uh -huh. And so how, and, why isn't that, I mean, I guess that has to be dealt with at a local, then at a state, right. then at a legislative level yeah, to and, stop. And the state and, and, and Virginia just passed a constitutional amendment changing it so that a, a bipartisan redistricting committee draws the lines and not the legislature. Um, right. And that's getting, because right now, when these guys draw their own lines, they draw it to make themselves safe. And it's every encouragement in the world to be as extreme as they want to be. Right, because they're never because they're never going to hurt them at the at the ballot box. Right, and, and it's going to last for the next ten years for whoever their successors might be. Right, and social media the, the the crazier you are, the more retweets you get, the more likes you get. Um, whereas you're saying, you know, why can't the adults sit down and have a conversation and compromise? Well, that's that's no fun. I mean, but why is that such a fantasy? Right, like it seems like common sense. <laughs> um, we'll put it this way: uh, You ever drive by a car accident? Yeah. You say, you know, that's a horrible thing. I'm not going to look. I shouldn't look at that. Right. I shouldn't look to see if somebody's injured because that that's not the right thing to do. I should keep my eyes on the road and not look at that accident. Right. You ever do that? No. No, nobody does. Everybody wants to watch the accident. What would you rather watch, a, a fight or a handshake? I mean, right now, I'd rather watch a whole <laughs> lot of handshakes, man, for real. But, you know, if you're selling tickets to a handshake or you're selling tickets to a boxing match, you know, who sells more tickets? Conflict, you know, 
conflict and controversy create cash. It's a show business term. And uh, unfortunately, you get, you know, the rowdier you are, the more attention you get. The more people like, even if people don't agree, they want to listen. I mean, then wouldn't you say that the current setting is primed for a moderate party? Oh, everybody's been saying that. Yeah. And uh, and some people think that this was kind of a, you know, this this election was enough saying, you know, I like Trump's policies, but after that first debate, I'm done. I'm right. Sick of I'm right. Four years yeah. of this kind of a. I watched that debate from start like to finish. I, I did not watch it live because I knew it was going to be a waste of my time. And then <laughs> the next day at work, I watched from start to finish and I, I wanted to turn it off the whole way through. Right. And I thought that the biggest champion of that whole thing was Chris Wallace. The end. <laughs> Just for trying to hold it together. And I've almost <laughs> given this answer three times and stopped. And I said, that, and at, at its core, the way you stop it is if it doesn't work at the ballot box, it'll stop. If people, if people act that way and still win, then you're going to get more of it. But right. if people act that way and lose, then it'll fizzle out. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, but do you really think that Trump is going to accept the loss? Because yeah, I've eventually. Read, I've read oh, an article. I don't think he'll, I think he's going to claim. I think he's going to claim that you know there was chicanery and you know these states didn't want him and they found a way to cheat to win. But he'll be back to fight another day. Right. Well, I but I read a. I, I don't know about the source, but I read a Politico article that it and it seemed feasible. I put it up on my Facebook the other day that Trump is like amassing all this money right now to fight lawyers, but really he's going to use those funds to turn around and start his own network and kind of. Well, he can't. Start, <laughs> no, yeah. But like it, to start it, nudging illegal, the it, next be generation of him. You can't convert that into personal funds. So. Well, I don't know. It, 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 it but there went into talking, more look, details about the, shadow funding and stuff that I don't. And I got and, and I got interviewed by uh, I got interviewed by a radio show months ago. And they asked me the question because they already heard rumbling that you know if Trump doesn't win this thing, he's going to start his own network to, to compete with the fake news. And you know he might. I don't know but why. Just but, to compete with the fake news. I mean, he'll start his own network to continue. Like, he's going to be the first president that doesn't just go away. Like, it's a guarantee. You right? think Obama went away? I, I mean, <laughs> I guess not. He still stepped in for a nudge here and there, but. Yeah, I think Trump. I mean, literally in the same fashion that he just ran the White House, he's going to run now from without of the yeah, White I House. Think I don't know if Trump's going to start his own network. I know he's definitely going to start his own content. I don't know if it's a network or whatever the right. thing is going to be, but I think he's going to start his own contract. His, start own, his, own, his own social media firm. Right, something maybe. Um, but he's going to start owning his own content like The Apprentice again. Um, and get himself on TV for the next four years and just beat the living heck out of Joe Biden on his platform. Exactly. And, and set himself up for 2024. I think he's going to come back and say, it was my vaccine that killed COVID. Um, oh, really? You yeah. Man. <laughs> I can see it. I can see it happening. And the only reason it wouldn't happen is if he didn't want it. I mean, there's so many people saying that that's, that's likely, uh, even despite his age. It wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't have surprised me if he won, gave up, and then, or, you know, won, served his term, and then tried again and after four years, you know. Right to not serve consecutively, but to like, there's just, I don't know. He must get some kind of rush out of it. <laughs> see, that's the thing, because if I was him, I'd look in the mirror and say, hey, I was president of the United States. How many people get to say that? So once you're yeah. out of that job, it's, you know, there are not many presidents who want to be president again. You know, well, that's what they... I'm saying. Most of the, the preceding presidents leave office and then it's just hands. They're like, I'm done, I did mine, and... good. Right. Handshakes, speeches, nods to the next guy. Right. That's right. that's mostly what it's been. But I feel like Trump is going to be the first one to step out of that role and then 
Well, it's not a hard bet. I mean, if you if, if 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 there's something every other president does, you bet that Trump's not going to be like that. You're you're probably going to be right. So right. It, it, there's there's nothing about him that's in like anybody else. So I've got one more question that I kind of wanted to finish on, and I posted something in relation to this on Facebook a couple of weeks back. But um, given the current climate that we've been discussing, which including includes social media, mainstream media, our current politicians, everything, if if we had I don't know. I don't even know how to say this. Like if we had to reform our nation today, do you think that we'd be capable of doing it in a, in a way that, you know, like we could be our own forefathers, right? That if uh, we, if we could like just shut everything down, restart it anew and, and rewrite the constitution so that it fit everybody's agendas. So there wasn't all this misinterpretation. And I think it meant this, and I think it meant that, you know, if we could, if we could rewrite it all, do you, re do you think that we would be able to do that? Or do you think that there's like far too much chaos for that? Here, well, I think you'd be able to do it. I don't think it would look anything like what we have now. Right. I think the first amendment would be gone. Really? There's too, many, there's too many people out there who want people punished for what they say. So right. say bye-bye to freedom of speech. Say, you know, if you say the wrong thing at the wrong time about the wrong subject, you're fired. And, uh, and I don't think the second amendment, um, I don't think the second amendment is written remotely the way it is now if right. somebody had to start from scratch. Um, there's a, and uh, I don't think the Fourth Amendment uh, about unreasonable searches and seizures, I don't right. think that gets written the same way if we were starting over now, because there's too right. many people who would say, um, well, so, what about So terrorism? exactly to my point, the answer is really no. Like we, we, could, we could do it, but you we could wouldn't it, be it, nearly as successful as our forefathers were at creating a new nation and, and, and it's amazing that they were successful because most countries that tried to do what they did failed. Really? And I mean, when you think about it, especially in today's day and age, I mean, with, with all of the ability, like we have the ability to find all of the best intellectuals of our time. We can connect to these people, but there are those among us who would just ignore them <laughs> like that, and that I mean it's human nature but it just when and this is what I'm getting at with with my whole channel with reading common sense you know we have to focus on what's common about us to keep something like this running otherwise it's a muck <laughs> right yeah what my government teacher in school said one thing that I still remember and he just made me think of it our system works because we want it to. And as soon as we don't want it to work, it'll start failing. Right. But America works because Americans want it to work. I mean, that's very true. For, so, all, for all the reasons that it doesn't work, it does continue to work because we drive it to continue to work. Right. If a majority of us ever decided that, it's, it's, that, that we don't want it anymore, then we're in, they're, they're in, then we're in the new frontier. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid of what that means. <laughs> well, I mean, the fact is, the fact is, I think that just would mean an open civil war, right? Because that would be the the cause for our country to dissolve at at that level, like where you're saying. All of a sudden, we decide the majority of us decide we don't want it anymore. It doesn't just happen reformed. that easily. It's not like we all go, "Hey, we don't want it anymore. Let's sign a petition. It's done." No, we'd go oh. into a civil war to decide oh. that we didn't want it anymore. I know countries aren't started or ended peacefully usually. Um, usually, it's somebody wins it by force. So um, we bet we we better we better make our system as workable as it can be because the, uh, the other way around. And who says that there would be America? Um, this may be you know if 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 the worst happened in in our constitutional republic. Our democratic republic fell apart. Um, 
and you know, the United States of America could be bifurcated into multiple nations. You know, right. The South could be the South and the North can be the North and the West can be the West. Texas can be its own nation. And, you know, California could be its own nation. It just depends now, how all the California chips go, right? California could split in half. It could be Northern California versus Southern California. It's just anything right. could happen. But once you cross that line of, of, uh, of military force um, and the states banding together against each other, and you're talking a, a true civil war. Um, and, and what might happen is, is that you know, America ceases to exist and collections of states band together and form their own nations. Right. I, well, How's that for a pick me up? I would see that as pretty likely. Actually, I've thought about that before. Just because at least from an already existing governmental standpoint, that would be the best move, right? Try to take control of the people within your state and then hope to, you know, reach from without and make deals and that kind of thing, you know? Right. Well, once once you cross that Trade Rubicon deals. of... Once you once you cross that Rubicon of throwing out what we have, then it's you know it's a blank slate. Um, I, I I you know I don't like it, but you know when you open up the, the possibility of civil war, they don't usually end nicely. And uh, I it, the, we could have been a divided America in the 1860s uh, had the outcome been different. Right. So. It's not like it's impossible. It almost happened. What do you feel about, uh, or like, what what do you know rather about the kind of change in um, the change in the party's ideals, like from the Civil War to to the Civil? Oh, they War totally shifted. Now, like, I know they kind of shifted. So, how did that work? Like, what was it that caused the shift? Was it the Civil War? Like, was that the period at which that that well, demographic it, shifted, or was it? Well, it, well it's complicated because it's not just the party shifted. You know, parties ended. There were the there was the Whig Party, which ceased, ceased to exist. There was the, right. Demo the Democratic Republican Party that became the Democratic Party. There right. Was, um, the Republican Party founded in eighteen sixty solely on the, the issue of slavery. Um, um, and the Republican Party became the party of the Northern industrial powers and the Democratic Party were the sub Southern farmers and plantation owners. Right. And, you know, a hundred years later, everything shifts. And, you know, the Republicans are the suburbs and the rural and the big industrial cities are all Democrats. So the Democratic um, Republicans were those who were Kind of, I guess initially they were. They were rural agrarian. Right. They were majority like the blue collar backbone of America early on. Yeah, except, you know, that early there was no, you know, there was no blue collar. Right, right. You know? But you, you were basically <laughs> farmer. I mean, I mean, there was, they just didn't call it blue collar then. Oh, I mean, there was no industrial revolution yet there was no factory so but i mean it would just be a different kind of blue collar you worked, right? on the land or you, you worked on the land or you worked on the water uh or if you were in the city you worked in some kind of commerce um, right so but, the, but, i mean but, that that would essentially be their white collar right but uh in the 1950s and 1960s the uh the Southern Democrats started dying out and being replaced by Southern Republicans. And the Rockefeller Republicans in, North, in the North got phased out by industrial Democrats. Democrats have controlled the big cities ever since the 60s and 70s. Right. You know, the parties, as far as, as far as the makeup of who was a Republican and who was a Democrat, the parties essentially shifted parts of the country. Got you. So there, the ideals for each party didn't necessarily shift, just like the parties. Pundits or or what? Hey, what would you call them? The 
their patrons, <laughs> the yeah. different parties' patrons shifted. Yeah. Based on was, demographics in the country, what was going yeah. on during the industrial age. Yeah, because if you're if you're primarily in the Northeast and the West Coast, you care about different issues than if you're in Kansas, and Indiana, and Texas. Right. So it's almost like who you are decides your issues, not the other way around. Right. Who makes up your party decides what the issues and values of the party are, not the other way around. Definitely. Um, this became out, you know, the, the party's regional strongholds decided what their issues and what their values were. Not the other way around. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And when the, when the geography shifted, the issue shifted. Yeah. Well, Brian, we hope it wasn't almost, boring. Huh? No, not at all. Not at all. And we we are almost pushing two hours. You said we wouldn't have two hours of content. We're uh, twelve I, minutes shy. I can put another twelve. We can bring something else up. But uh, what, did, is, is there anything? Any of your anything in your notes you didn't get to? Uh, no. Nope. We covered it all. Holy moly. Um. Let me let me just double check. Oh, okay. I got one. Okay, so let's close on this. What was the highlight of your career so far, and That's the changing. lowest point—the lowest point of your career? <clears throat> okay, this is so easy. The highest point of my career has been two weeks ago. Okay, when we won a mayor's re-election. We probably spent about two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars, and our opponent easily spent a million dollars. Um, and everyone thought that we were just going to get crushed. Who and was your candidate? Bobby Dyer, Mayor okay. of Virginia Beach. Um, okay. And they threw the kitchen sink at him, and and he had the biggest winning margin of his career. That nice. was. You know, second place is the first time he ran for mayor because nobody thought he was going to win then and shock the world. This is right. his third consecutive election where everybody thought he was going to lose and he won. Um, the worst was in 2005 because I decided that I was so good that I was going to take two candidates and run them against Republican incumbents in a primary. And we got beat so bad and I created so much bad blood for myself in the party that I challenged two sitting Republicans with challengers, really had no chance of winning. And uh, it taught me a lesson to just, you know, pick your spots. And was that because you aligned more with those candidates or was that just somebody was put those candidates in your lap uh, yeah i came off i had a big win in 2004 and i could do, i thought i could do no wrong and i could take any candidate and and make magic so right out of the gate in 2005 you tried to pull a rain man <laughs> as I was a like, like yeah i can make anybody win I'm, I'm, you know we'll run against these republican incumbents who never lost to any elections in their lives and, and i'll show them they beat the pants off of me and uh, and luckily enough, um, after it was all over, they both talked to me and said, I'm like, man, I suck. I'm getting out of the business. And they're like, no, no, no. You're a smart kid. You just got to learn a little bit more and we'll help you. And they kind of they both kind of took me under their wing and mentored me after I ran somebody against them. And so everybody kind of brought me back into the good graces of the party because they gave me their stamp of approval. It was your lowest point, but it kind of was the the foundation for what where well, you are now. Most lowest points are the foundation of where you are now. Is that is that all right, know? smart ass? <laughs> well, that's the way it, you know. It's, that, that's the best way it could work out. If you actually learned something from a failure, did you really fail? Right. I, yeah, I failed big time, and could have had and created a lot of bad blood that really could have knocked me out of the business completely. Right. It wound up teaching me a whole lot about how to do what I do. Um, again, learning what not to do and uh, not just take any candidate who comes along because they say, hey, we're going to win. Well, every candidate says they're going to win. Did you have a campaign consultant mentor or was it just you 
poking and prodding and paving your way over time, taking Figuring things from here and there? Figuring it out. Um, there was an organization Newt Gingrich had called Goat Pack that taught people how to, how to be candidates. And I ordered that and read all the materials and watched all the videotapes, figuring if I learned how to be a candidate, I'd learn how to be a consultant. And I'd kind of make it up as I go. But literally, you know, I lost in 2001. I won in 2002. I lost in 2003. I won in 2004. I lost in 2005. I won four races in 2006. And it, and it was off to the races from there. So a lot of my education of how of learning this was a lot of losses in the early years, trying to find out, trying to teach myself how to do this. Because there, there was no book, there was no class, and there weren't a whole lot of people in this part of Virginia doing what I did. They were all in right. DC. So I, I really, the only mentors I had were, were politicians who let me into their campaigns to kind of show me the ropes. To my living knowledge, I feel like Virginia has always kind of gone back and forth, blue and red, right? It really has. Why um, is it not considered a swing state? Uh, because Northern Virginia has absolutely exploded with people who are absolutely dependent on federal spending for their jobs and careers. And just Republicans haven't been competitive in Northern Virginia in 10 years. Fairfax County in Northern Virginia has so many so much population and so many voters that it can render most of the rest of the state irrelevant. A Republican has to do really well in Northern Virginia. And, you know, it's a, you know, that's, you know, that's the- uh, Just the road. Right, well, it's right next to Washington, DC. Right. Um, career, you know, career bureaucrats live in Northern Virginia. So True. when somebody comes around saying, I'm going to cut government spending, they're not really thrilled about that. Makes sense. So, yeah, that pretty much wraps it all up. Um, cool final you... question, man. That, was, <laughs> that made me think for a little bit. Do you, um, are you cool with coming back at some point to talk about sure. movies? Do a whole yeah, episode about movies? I I'd think uh, I, I I was thinking about this earlier, so maybe I'll have you like kind of compile a top five, and I'll compile a top five. We'll compare and contrast, and then kind of throw in yeah, make me whatever five, comes up. Five out of eleven thousand, really good. I feel like the next one though doesn't necessarily need to be structured at all. I don't need a whole <laughs> bunch of notes. I don't need you know. I, I feel like movie wise, we can kind of wing it, other than coming up with our own fixed list. Well, it's like, kind of good so. because I I I did a. I did a whole college thesis my senior year that had not that had to do with nothing but movies. And, oh, wow. uh, yeah, and I went through different decades about why certain genres seem to be successful, and uh, I I kind of connected what was going on in America with what was going on in the movies, because a lot of times you can tell a lot about what's going on in the country by what movies people watch, and uh, it was a neat thesis to study. Just like now, there's a pandemic going on, so everybody's watching pandemic movies. <laughs> that makes sense, right? Well, it's it's really weird because it's, it's uh, pandemic movies and reality TV. Yeah, I know, but but with all the theaters shut down, there's no real box office. So there's no real movies. Movies used to give me a real insight in, in, in what the public was thinking. True. Now, I guess every movie is more or less a private private endeavor. Yeah, movies in the house don't have the same communal experience as a, a theater full of people. I mean, you know, a right. comedy, you know, a comedy is different in a theater when you hear everyone else laughing. And a horror movie is scarier when people are screaming. And, right. Uh, there's so there's there's something that's missing when you watch movies at, at home by yourself or with one or two other people. There's something about the theater experience that's that's different. Well that'll be a fun thought to reminisce on for the next episode because be by the time we have our next episode i mean theaters are going down so <laughs> sadly right yeah I mean, well, it, our I next stop, episode might stop. be only like six to eight weeks away or something but by then theaters might be a thing of the past <laughs> well i still make great popcorn so <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, thank you All very right. much for being on my show and in support of it. And uh, I'll catch you next time. See you. Later.